Hi everyone, this is Matthew Brewer. I'm a marriage and family therapist uh, associate at the Tierney Psychotherapy Group in downtown San Francisco, and I'm here today to talk about sleep and manic depression, otherwise known as bipolar, and how they can affect each other. Uh, please stay tuned. Thank you. So when I think of sleep, I think of Goldilocks and the Three Bears. You don't want too much, not too little, you want it just right. And so, in that regard, I've discovered a few different tips um, on how to get some restful sleep. And so, we're going to be talking about these tonight, uh, Wednesday, in our bipolar therapy group. Um, and I'd like to discuss them here with you while it's just you and I, nobody else around. Uh, so, let's get started. Tip number one is to get regular rhythms and times of sleep. To have that structure that your body and your brain can expect to know when to go to sleep, when to wake up, and that can help you get some restful sleep. Most people know that and can just be a good reminder. The second tip is to keep your bed for only sleep and romance. Not to use it for playing video games or other things where the association begins to be with awake, alertness. You know, you want the bed to be associated with sleep and rest. Uh, so try to just, you know, keep that in a very behavioral type of way. Um, in your mind. The second, the third, <laughs> if I can count, did I get enough sleep last night? Um, is to have an aesthetic environment that's clean and clutter-free. They often talk about how having a cluttered environment is kind of representative or correlates with having a cluttered mind. So that if your sleep environment is more clean and not littered with distractions, it can be easier to get to sleep. And then the fourth tip here is to create total darkness and quiet to reduce any light that you can possibly, you know, block out, whether it's from the window, from a clock that's blaring in your face, um, as many of us struggle with using our phones and stuff. Try not to do that in bed. I know I'm guilty of that. And also to have quiet. I personally have a white noise machine in my room to help block out some of my neighbors, and it does wonders. I highly recommend that. Uh, dome white noise machine which many therapists use in their offices to help protect confidentiality. So the next tip here is to avoid caffeine, alcohol, and heavy exercise at night. These different activities and substances can easily interfere with our sleep. Um, the next tip is to get morning sunlight for at least 20 minutes. Um, that helps reset the circadian rhythms, um, getting that sunlight into your brain, through your eyes, and I'm blanking out on all the biochemistry of it at the moment, but you know that sunlight definitely helps keep our, our rhythms on track. Um, also, try not to eat uh, three hours before bed. I know I break this one all the time. I eat way late at night, and then my stomach is full of food. I think it can be hard to get to sleep, and I think I'm trying to digest all night long, and I often wake up with a stomach ache. So if you're able to restrain yourself from eating, um, before going to bed, that could be one way to potentially get some better sleep. Another habit that people that get good sleep have is to write down their worries, maybe before going to bed, before getting in bed, and so then they're not floating around in your mind, incomplete, you know, that incomplete gestalt. Instead, they're written down, you can get back to them, and your mind can more easily get rest. Um, another tip here is to take a bath before bedtime. That can be really relaxing and soothing to, you know, both physical and mental emotional um, stuff going on. Can kind of help put you in the right mindset. It can be a cue, a stimulus to, for your body to start winding down if it becomes a part of your routine. Epsom salts and essential oils like chamomile or lavender can be helpful to induce the body to be in a more restful sleep, sleep ready state. And if you're lucky enough to be able to get a massage before bed or just do some stretching on your own, that can help also prepare the body. It could be a good routine to consider. Um, another one that I'm a little unfamiliar with, I've never really tried myself, but it, it contends that warming your middle can help you get to sleep. I guess uh, potentially heating up your core a little bit might help. At the same time, I'm kind of in contradiction, I'm told that better sleep can happen in a cooler environment where uh, it's a little easier to get to rest, to sleep, uh, like a, cool, a cool room and a nice warm blanket or able to breathe. I don't know. Whatever works for you can be very personal. And the last of these tips here is, you know, potentially try some herbal or nutrient therapies. Some people use melatonin. Um, there's a lot of other herbs and teas and stuff that can help you get some good sleep. 
Now I'd like to share a little data with you. Uh, according to a report done by the National Institutes of Medicine on Sleep, 50 to 70 million Americans are regularly deprived of sleep or suffer from some sleep problems. Lack of sleep has been connected to Alzheimer's. And longer lasting sleeplessness contributes to problems with learning, memory, depression, and ADD. The stress hormone cortisol increases with lack of sleep, causing damage to the hippocampus, an area that's responsible for emotions and memory. So these are just some important things to keep in mind that not getting quality sleep can actually affect your mental and physical health in some of these different ways. So anything you can do to get better sleep is a great improvement for your overall health. Um, ba -ba -ba, another, some more research here. An adequate amount of sleep is a major helper in balancing hormones. Like we just mentioned that cortisol. So we don't want too much cortisol because it's a stress hormone. Our bodies have natural rhythms that can be disturbed by irregular or insufficient sleep. Melatonin and growth hormone, for example, are brought into better balance with proper sleep. Um, McNaughton and Pullman in 2006 reported that sleep deprivation also leads to depression, which is particularly relevant to us um, as people struggling with mood disorders. And it can also not only lead to depression, but decreased cognitive performance and slowed reaction times. So that lack of sleep can really start to trigger some different problematic um, experiences for people. And then just kind of touching a little bit more directly into bipolar, you know, oftentimes this is the too little too much. When people are manic, one of the symptoms is that they have a decreased need for sleep and they can stay up all hours of the night, pacing around, racing thoughts, pressured speech, and not able to get sleep. And it's kind of this vicious cycle. And then on the flip side, in depression, people can often have a really hard time getting out of bed um, and just wanting to sleep for 9, 10, 12 hours or longer and just not even leave their room. It's like, why, why bother? And so anything we can do to kind of get that regular sleep and not disturb that pattern can help our mood. So I also wanted to offer everyone um, some really super recent research that was just published two days ago in the journal JAMA Neurology. It found that adults with healthy memories who had disrupted circadian rhythms, also known as the sleep cycles, if they had disruptions in these, uh, there was an increased um, discovery of uh, the buildup of proteins um, called amyloid plaques, which can serve as an early sign of Alzheimer's. So disruptions in these sleeping patterns can potentially lead to an increase in these amyloid plaques, which it could be hard to know. We kind of have a chicken and egg correlation problem and not exactly sure of the causality. Does these buildup of amyloid plaques on their own disturb sleep or does a disturbance in sleep increase the buildup of these plaques? Either way, the findings suggest that working to treat sleep issues early may help protect brain health down the road, though more research is obviously needed. So with these preliminary findings, if we are able to improve our sleep hygiene, we can help pre preserve our brain functions in the long run. Um, you know, and I think it's much more wise to take a preventative health approach than to try to solve things down the road. You know, many, many years, decades of poor sleep, it's not likely to have the best effect. Whereas if you can increase the quality of your sleep throughout your life, it'll serve you well in your later years. So another thing I want to share with you, it's a diagram here, um, is the electroencephalographic recordings um, that happen in the different stages of sleep. As many of you will remember, um, there's one through four, and then there's rapid eye movement. And they kind of talk about different types of um, slow wave sleep, um, the frequencies change, all these different ways of looking at sleep if you're really into neuroscience. And the one thing that I wanted to mention is there's this um, phenomenon called the sleep spindle, which is described here as a sudden burst of oscillatory brain activity generated in the reticular nucleus of the thalamus that occurs during stage two of light sleep. So that's really super technical, but if anybody's into that, I do encourage you to look more. There's a lot of fascinating things that go on in our brainwave patterns. Um, so researchers believe that these sleep spindles represent periods of time where the brain inhibits mental processing in order to keep the person in a tranquil state. So the way I'm almost kind of understanding it is it's like static to kind of help block out any disruption in sleep. Um, and then there's this other thing known as K-complexes, which are larger waves that react to external stimuli while sleeping. 
some of these different patterns on here. Um, research has shown that sleepers who produce spindles more frequently tend to require a higher amount of noise to be woken up. This indicates that people with higher levels of sleep spindles are likelier to enjoy higher quality sleep. So if people that have more of these sleep spindles are more likely to sleep soundly, curious if there's anything we can do to promote more sleep spindles. Uh, fortunately, they do mention two different things. Um, melatonin seems to promote sleep spindles, which may explain why some people find it helpful for sleep. And sleep spindles also seem to increase the night following when a person has learned something new. So there's a lot of interesting research about how continuing to use your brain and learn new things promotes overall brain health. And one of the ways it could do that is by increasing these sleep spindles. Kind of on the flip side of mental health, we have an interesting possibility around mental illness and sleep spindles which may potentially be used as a biomarker for schizophrenia someday, since people with schizophrenia display an abnormal pattern of fast and slow spindles, as well as reduced levels of spindles overall when compared to the average population. So anything we can do to promote regular increased amounts of sleep spindles, whether it's some melatonin, talk to your doctor, um, or do some research on your own, or if it's learning something new, which is what we can all easily do, you know, learn at least a couple new things every day, whether it's reading, which is particularly beneficial, watching documentaries, etc., doing some Sudoku puzzles. So all those things uh, during the day can help you have improved sleep at night. Um, so I did want to share one little joke with you all. It's a little person here sleeping. I wish I could sleep, but my stupid ADHD kicks in, and while well, basically one sheep, two sheep, cow, turtle, duck, old MacDonald had a farm. Hey, Macarena! Thank you everyone for uh, watching this video. I did want to invite you to our Integral Therapy Bipolar Group on Wednesday nights in downtown San Francisco. If you're in the Bay Area, we'd love to have you. And if you're anywhere in California, I am happy to talk to you as a therapist by video. And if you are across the country or world, we do have an online support group for bipolar and other mood disorders on Facebook. And that is uh, found on the links. And it's also facebook.com slash group slash bipolar blues. So thank you again for watching and I hope to see you next time.